Listening to the Talk Line Network. You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program, Mom Zev Brenner. We're looking at Lakewood versus Yeshua University, the shaping of orthodoxy in America. Shmuel Winniar has joined us. He is a real estate attorney with Herbst and Weiss in Spring Valley, New York. He's a Talmud of Ner Yisrael, Baltimore, Merkas Harav, Merkas Hatori in Jerusalem, in Yerushalayim. He's also a historian and he's lectures on this very topic we're discussing. So, uh, Shmuel, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So let's begin with Lakewood. Now, Lakewood Yeshiva, of course, is big, over 6,000 students. Tell me them that are there today, very successful. Uh, but it didn't really begin in Lakewood, New Jersey. I believe it, it began in New York in the White Plains. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, there was a Rabbi Hillel Bishko who had a uh, kolal in White Plains. Uh, Rabbi Aaron Cutler was asked to become the uh, Rosh Kola of that Yeshiva. He agreed conditional on transplanting or transplanting or moving that uh, Kolo to Yeshiva to uh, Lakewood, New Jersey, where the name based Medish Kovoa pre-existed and he planted it there. And, and when did Rav Aaron Kotler come to the United States? Uh, Erev Pesach, 1943. I believe he first landed in San Francisco. And okay, he came to New York. So why did he decide to move it from White Plains to Lakewood, New Jersey? Well, I think Lakewood itself had two attractions. One was uh, a certain distance from New York City, the hustle and bustle from the Lower East Side, from Williamsburg at the time, but at the same time, it wasn't too far. And second was Lakewood historically in the 19th century, uh, going back to Vanderbilt, to Astor, is before Florida was a destination in the winter. Many uh, wealthy and then eventually became a Jewish uh, de uh, resort destination. There was uh, the Tisch family had hotels there at Laurel and the Pine well into the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And that came with wealthy donors and a wealthy clientele, and that would hopefully be wealthy donors to the new yeshiva. And of course, that's the lifeline of yeshiva, of course, getting people to contribute and, and building up. And I think Lakewood has been very successful in getting people to donate and help build the yeshiva into a preeminent Torah institution in the world. Uh, absolutely. I think they, uh, just a couple of months ago, they had an event in Philadelphia, which was essentially celebrating the significant uh, Balabatim, uh, the significant resources that Balabatim have been investing in Lakewood Yeshiva itself, and obviously the many satellites that have sprung up. Now, now of course, their base is in Lakewood, New Jersey, but where else have they sprung up around the country? So both in the USA and Canada, Lakewood, well, first of all, Lakewood technically has a branch by one of our Baron Cutler's grandsons in Yerushalayim, uh, based on uh, of Yerushalayim and Ramot. But also, the, they started back in, under Schneer Cutler's uh, time frame and leadership. Well, actually, take a step back. So, uh, in the 50s already, Shmuel Kamenetsky and Rebellious Sve went to Philadelphia. Denver had a yeshiva of Talmudim Scranton. And then kind of the community co concept, which I'm not sure if Chicago or Toronto was first, but each of those have, you know, Lakewood Community Coilum. Uh, we're kind of Toronto, Chicago, uh, Miami, almost every major city in, I don't want to say every major, most major cities, Pittsburgh has a Lakewood Colo, there's community of Colum throughout, and those people eventually take on leadership positions in those communities. No, certainly, and we've been very successful with that. Now, now I want to turn to Yeshiva University. Yeshiva University began, oh, over 100 years ago, so let's look at when they started and, and look at how they have grown over the course of time as well. Uh, sure. So Yeshiva University has actually well uh, well over 100 years now. It's probably, uh, I can't do the math, but 1886, um, I guess 135 years or 36 years. Um, in 1886, there was an elementary school really as the first waves of Eastern European immigrants were coming to the U.S., the Lower East Side in significant numbers. You know, the first uh, elementary school, Yeshiva Seitz Chaim, was founded, a Chaim named after him, just like the Belajan Yeshiva, was founded for elementary school boys. Approximately, I believe, 1896, there was Rabbi Moshe Matlin, who felt that once they finished Yeshiva Seitz Chaim, where were they going to go? Where was the place for higher level learning? And first in his apartment, and then in space on the Lower East Side, he opened up, we'll call it a high school in Masifta, 
uh, for students that when they named it the following year after Rabbi Yitzhak Al-Khan inspector, right, the Gadol Hadar who passed away, Yeshiva Shabbat Shalom Al-Khanan, eventually the Eitz Chaim and Rit or Yeshiva Shabbat Shalom Al-Khanan merge and a couple more permutations. In 1915, it becomes, you know, what we call, you know, Yeshiva College, Yeshiva Shabbat Shalom Al-Khanan. And they didn't have an easy time because I think at one point they had also financial problems. I mean, they have financial problems today too, but I think at one point they had some major financial problems also. Uh, there definitely were times in the 70s, also earlier on, and the, uh, they actually going to jump in a little bit ahead in their time frame. They, uh, under Rabbi Dr. Bernard Herdo Revel, in the, who became president in 1915, in the 20s, he kind of shifted, the, he started MTA, he kind of built the vision, the embryo, the nucleus of what we would think of Yeshiva University today. And in the late 20s, he attempted what was called a $5 million campaign. And the a lot of money in 1920, that's a ton of and a fortune of money. Correct, correct. It was it was people thought, you know, the Jewish forward made fun of him. They thought he was it was pie, a pie in the sky type of numbers. He did get three important Balabat, if my memory serves me correctly. Nathan Lamport, for anybody here who's a Yeshiva University grad, Lamport Auditorium, uh, Mendel Gottesman, the Gottesman Library, um, and Harry Fischel, all of each contributed $100,000 as a pledge. They pledged $100,000. This is in the late 20s towards building the campus in Washington Heights, moving it from the Lower East Side to Washington Heights. But that actually then came 1929, the Depression, and other place institutions, RDJ, closed its doors. But Yeshiva College at that time had a lot of problems financially. There was even talk at one point, I don't know if it was that time, that even merging with the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, which was a different institution then than it is today, that didn't go anywhere. But there was some talks about merger as well because of the financial situation. Uh, well, I'm not sure. I don't know the exact role of how the finances played in. I'm sure that some of the prominent lay leaders uh, or Balabat, depending on what term you want to prefer, were wondering why are we sponsoring two institutions, JTS and Yeshiva University or Yeshiva Kal or Ritz at the time. I think already in the 20s, there was enough uh, theological distance, if you will, between JTS and in particular, the presence of Mordechai Kaplan um, was, was a, I know, a bit of an issue in those mergers. But yes, in the 20s, there were conversations of JTS and Yeshiva College about mergers. Today, you know, it sounds, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, but it did happen. Well, but, but let's also tell that the Jewish Theological Seminary was a different place. A lot of the Orthodox rabbinate, the uh, Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, other synagogues, they were ordained at the at JTS. It was a different huh. institution than it is today. Even Which Mordecai Kaplan, um, well, he had an Orthodox smicha too, if I remember correctly. So, so I think you're very right on the point in pointing out that JTS and, you know, at its very inception, the demarcation lines between, you know, the demon denominational lines that we have today between, you know, the conservative movement and orthodoxy were significantly more blurred. Um, you know, the same people who founded the Orthodox Union founded JTS. And <laughs> I think- And also Young Israel was founded by some JTS rabbis too. Rabbi, rabbi I think in Israel, Friedlander. I yeah, Israel Friedlander you know, was involved in that. But also one fun little Rabbi Herbert, you're, you live, I believe you live part of the time on the West Side at least. Correct, rabbi yes. Herbert Goldstein of the West Side Institutional, right? He was a JTS graduate who eventually became the president of, I believe, the OU and the RCA. So, you know, that's the, you know, at that time, the lines were, you know, somewhat more fluid, correct? Right. And obviously, at some point in time, things change. But orthodoxy was different prior to the end of World War II. And we'll talk about, you know, in fact, when not just with Lakewood, but also the Hasidic influx that changed the face of orthodoxy. But what was orthodoxy like prior to the end of World War II in America? Well, I think I think you're touching really on what I tend to view as the key difference between, you know, you said, you know, the, I don't call it the battle between YU versus Good, but the fundamental difference between, you know, to use these terms, you know, broadly in modern orthodoxy and the Haredi world is that before the war, people who were coming to the United States um, were coming as immigrants, right? And people who came really 1939 to 1945 and afterwards, primarily, obviously exceptions, you know, abound on each side, but they came not as immigrants, but as refugees. And the immigrants who came to America came to succeed. They wanted to buy into the American dream. They wanted to come they wanted to send their children to college. They wanted to, to varying degrees, many maintain their Yiddishkeit, 
perpetuate their Yiddishkeit and what they brought over from the Eastern Europe or wherever else they came from, but they came as immigrants and that was their choice. Of course, at that time, you know, in Europe, we still viewed the American, uh, we viewed America as the Shane and Zen and Trape, as the stones are still Trape. People like Rabbi Aaron Kotler, people like the Tells of Rashi Yeshiva, you mentioned Kassidin, let's say people like the Satmar Rav came not willing to, they didn't come to be accommodate America. They were forced to come here. And when they came here, they, you know, wanted to really transplant exactly what they had in Europe here in the United States. And to a large degree, they've re- we Re, reinvigorated orthodoxy because what I was orthodoxy was different uh, prior to that. I think you had, uh, there, and in fact, a lot of orthodox synagogues had balabat, and people went to daven Shabbos morning and went to work. Right. No, hundred percent. There definitely was that. You know, I, again, there's some of these things are you know, age wise. You know, I just find it even hard to comprehend. But you know, Rev, one of my mentors, Rev. Dr. Aaron Rakhefet, uh, often talks about, and it's been written up. That you had people who, you know, Shabbos morning would get up, they lived in the Bronx, they lived in at the Lower East Side elsewhere, and they went to Hamish Davening Shabbos morning uh, early, and then they got up and they went to work, and regrettably, and they didn't have, you know, and it was what it was. I don't think, I think pre-war primarily, obviously there was Tayyar Vadas, there was RJJ, there were, you know, there were pioneers, there was Yeshiva University in various forms, but bar and large, you had a, the educational infrastructure that we have today did not exist. And it was a lot harder for people, you know, the, today it's, I, I don't want to say comfortable, but to keep Shabbos today, you know, uh, just now all the, right now we're in the middle of all these Yom and Tobin, I'm able to take off from work, no problem. You know, it was, a, it was a very different challenge before the war. Well, listen to not just for the holidays for Yom and Tobin, but for regular Shabbos, a lot of people um, had, couldn't get unemployment, couldn't get employment unless they worked on Shabbos. It was a lot, very difficult. It wasn't like it is today. We have the rights and if they discriminate against you, you can sue and do all kinds of things to make sure your rights are protected. But it wasn't the case in the 20s and 30s and early 40s. Um, it was tough. Uh, in fact, I mean, one of the things that I that I love quoting with Moshe Feinstein, he said, even those that were able to maintain an orthodox lifestyle and didn't work on Shabbos, but they kept saying Schwerz is hard to be a Jew. But Moshe said that's what killed Judaism in America to a certain degree, because if, if kids see the parents saying it's so tough to be a Jew, they said, what do I need it? And they left. And he was absolutely right. But, but it was difficult. We can't really f understand completely because, as you said, Shmuel, we're in a completely different realm today. It's much easier to practice Judaism. Um, but then it was, and it was tough. And those that did you know, and you didn't have the same yeshiva systems today. We have Kainahara, so many uh, Jews, so many children in yeshivas. <coughs> that wasn't the case uh, in the early part of, of the 1900s. Uh, I don't know how many yeshivas there were in America, but it was different than it is today. So, and, and when we, we continue our conversation, we're looking how orthodoxy was shaped. Yeshiva University on one hand, you have Lakewood on the other hand as well. Uh, Shmuel Winniars is our guest. He is an attorney, uh, but he's, he's also a historian. And they were looking at you know, Lakewood versus University shaping orthodoxy in America and how orthodoxy has changed over the course of time. You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. And we're back looking at Lakewood versus Yeshiva University, shaping of orthodoxy in America. Shmuel Winniars is our guest, <clears throat> real estate attorney with Hervis and Weiss in Spring Valley, New York, Talmud of Nair Yisrael, uh, Baltimore, America, has a Tori Yerushalayim, and he's a historian, and he's, as you see, he's very knowledgeable and studied uh, the growth of orthodoxy in America and how things have changed over the course of time. What would you say attributed to the success of Lakewood? I would say two things. One is Byron Cutler's force of personality in of himself. Um, I think everyone, you know, he, people talked about the fire of Torah. You know, he came and he came to the USA and in a, we'll call it uncompromising, you know, there were other, you know, we'll call them Haredi yeshivas of the time, uh, which allowed for various degrees of college, 
uh, at certain limitations at night, Tyre Vadas, Chaim Berlin, Mary Stroll, and all but Baron Cutler said, we're not going to look at what society, we're looking, we're coming here to replant the flag of Kletsk and Slutsk, the two issues he was in, and it's a complete focus, uncompromised, fully Slimada Torah in its, in its intensity, and that was his vision, and I think that that fire of Torah perpetuated and succeeded. Second, and I think this is just broader, is that uh, obviously Rabbi Aaron Cutler passed away in 1962, and uh, Rabbi Cutler picked up, picked up on, uh, was the Rosh Hashiva then for the next uh, 20 years. But I think the success was, is that in the same sense, uncompromising, is that there was a sense of authenticity towards it. So people, wherever they're coming from, sense, you know, this is Torah, you know, this is Torah, this is Torah going back to Sinai. And if people searching for, you know, searching for whether whatever background they come from, whether they want to support it, whether they want to send their child there, something that they want to perpetuate. Here's an email question from Saul. The original Rosh Yeshivas of the Philly Yeshiva was Rosh Shmuel Kamenetsky and Rav Dov Schwartzman, not Rav Eliot Svei, as your guest stated on the air a few minutes ago. He came a couple of years later. I know this because my late father was one of the first eight founding Bachram of the Philly Yeshiva. No, he's correct. Um, I think Rav Dov Schwartzman was there uh, for maybe, I don't know, the, uh, a year or two. Uh, he, was, um, he was married to Rav Aaron Cutler's daughter for a period of time. And he was there. He then left and uh, went to Eretz Yisrael and Rebellious Shve then came. And that's correct. Now, there was a one point you mentioned Rebellious Shve where there was some antagonism between Rebellious Shve and, and Rabbi Dr. Norman Lambish University. I believe he was called the caveman. There was a whole big hullabaloo at one point. But let's look at that. Uh, no, that's that's true. There definitely was some antagonism uh, in the con. Uh, there definitely has been, you know, criticisms between, well, broadly speaking, both camps, Rabbi Lamb, also, you know, uh, both Rabbi Elias Fay and Rabbi Lamb use terminology to describe the other, uh, not necessarily in the most positive light. Look, there is a fundamental difference. Can't deny that. Um, you know, Yeshiva University prides itself on, you know, what it calls itself Torah Umada, a synthesis or harmonious coexistence was the words of uh, Rabbi Revel. <clears throat> and obviously, when you look at it from a Torah only approach, which is, you know, we'll call it the Lakewood view, there's going to be tension between those two. I do know, interestingly, both Rabbi Elias Svei and Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb first went to Yeshiva Torah Vadas early in their life, before they went on one to YU and one to eventually Lakewood. And I like to think that, you know, obviously there was differences in this world, but now in the Ilam IMS, they are together and, uh, you know, hopefully find more unity than disunity. But, but there certainly has been antagonism between Yeshiva University and Lakewood. I think today it's probably less. So that's just a sense that I have out there. You even have publications in the Haredi world, such as Mishpacha or Ami, that are willing to feature the Rosh Yeshiva of uh, YU, of Herschel Schachter. But there was a period of time where at the Agudas Dafyomi, uh, where he wasn't allowed to uh, recite, uh, or he was, I believe, I don't know if he was invited to the day, so some controversy. I think that's changed over the course of time, but initially there was this antagonism. So let's look at why it was and how it abated over the course of time. Well, I think, again, when you're coming into, after after World War II, as you said, you know, you're coming out and there's, uh, I have to be careful here, right? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so in other words, uh, with, you know, Yeshiva University was, you know, bigger, was more an established institution, it represented orthodoxy broader to the world. And suddenly a more, I don't know if you wanted to use the word militant, but a more assertive orthodoxy to its right, right, began to emerge post-war by Baron Cutler, by Tel's Yeshiva. But, you know, uh, that is by definition going to create tension. In 1956, one of the more famous incidents was the, in 1956, there, uh, back in the 1920s, the Synagogue Council of America was founded. And that was a place for a quote, interdenominational dialogue, whether it's reform, conservative and orthodox. And in, in 1956, 11 Russia Yeshiva, Rabbi Aaron Kotler, Rabbi Ruderman from Neri Yisrael, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, Moshe Feinstein, and two Russia Yeshiva from YU, Rabbi Mendel Zaks, 
and Rav David Lipschitz signed a ban saying that it was forbidden for uh, the uh, for that we should not be part of the Synagogue Council of America because it engaged in interfaith dialogue with non-Orthodox denominations uh, or interdenominational dialogue, I should say. Um, but Rav Salvechik and Rav Dr. Samuel Belkin, who was president of the University at the time, were opposed to that. And I think there is a fundamental, there is a different of a philosophy. And you know, you know, uh, you know whether it's to some degree on the issue of Zionism. You know, these days, somewhat the, the you know the role of women. There are fundamental differences. And you know, when whether you're competing for the hearts of minds of you know orthodoxy, and whether it's institutions or whether it's shuls. If you're looking to be who's going to be the rub of the show, you're going to take someone from the right or you're going to take someone from, we'll call it the left. You know, that becomes a fight. So that's happened. That happens still today. Now, the Synagogue Council of America you're referring to in 1956, and I'm trying to think if there's another time with the New York Board of Rabbis. But if I remember correctly, and is that I think the Rav Rav Soloveitchik was contemplating or was supposed to sign on to one of the declarations, but somebody leaked it. Uh, to the media at that time, in which case he was upset that it was a leak before he made his final decision. He thought he was being forced into it. So that created some sort of an issue. Are you familiar with that? I have heard that. I don't, I can't say I, I don't want to speak to something I'm not super familiar with, but I have heard different variations and traditions, if you will, on that. Now, there was also a moment in time where Yeshiva Chaim Berlin was, there was, they were talking about making it a Yeshiva college similar to Yeshiva University. And uh, I'm not sure of the, of the year that that was um, supposed to take place, but there was opposition from Aaron Cutler and others uh, for that. So the idea was nixed, but there was some serious thought of making Chaim Berlin a Shiva University type yeshiva. It's actually, a, no, that's a, absolutely true. It was actually not just Chaim Berlin. There was an attempted discussion of a merger between Yeshiva Torah Vadas and Chaim Berlin to the strongholds of the Brooklyn yeshivas to probably meld themselves into something like Landers and Queens today. Uh, and you're right, Rabbi Aaron Cutler, that's an excellent example. Rabbi Aaron Cutler kind of by force of his personality and his views, really, whether it's in his organizational efforts and building that go to Sisrael of America, or whether it's Torah Umasora, which he was very involved in, you know, really brought, you know, he kind of ended up the leader, at, you know, in the 50s, that, you know, in really that time frame of kind of molding uh, um, right-wing orthodoxy. Or traditional do have, orthodoxy. Traditional. Do we have any knowledge of any meetings or interaction between Rav Aaron Cutler and Rav Soloveitchik? Uh, yes, I think there are several pictures. I think at various Chinuchatzma'i dinners we have in the 50s, um, we have recordings. I mean, they do, they both, Rav Soloveitchik, you know, obviously he did, you know, did spend time <coughs> in Berlin, which, you know, wasn't necessarily Rav Aaron Cutler, but Rav Sol, you know, Rav Soloveitchik's grandfather, Chaim Brisker, and a Baron Cutler coming from Slutsk and Klets, they were, you know, they were cut from the same Litvisha, Lithuanian yeshiva world. So definitely in the 50s, at least on several occasions, we have pictorial evidence of that. Um, but again, there was, you know, differences. Now, there were different, well, the differences, but then, in other words, did they have, well, I'm trying to ascertain, did they have a warm relationship and was the problem more with their followers, their Talmidim, their students, or was there friction in between the two leaders themselves? Well, I could, I can say that Rav Schneer Cutler, Rav Aaron Cutler's son and successor, and Rav Yashaber Soloveitchik, did have a warm personal relationship. There are people alive today who can tell you the stories that uh, I believe, I, I, I should be careful on the exact details, but Rav Schneer Cutler um, and Rav Yashaber and Rav Soloveitchik were went to were Menachem Oval each other on multiple occasions. Uh, Rav Soloveitchik lost his mother, his sister, and his oh, sorry, his mother, wife, and brother all in the mid sixties. And there are you know there's a lot of there's a lot of stories about the time when Rav Soloveitchik was Menachem Oval him, and also um, and and the reverse as well. So I think there was a warm Rav Aaron Cutler specifically. I'm not aware of a close warm relationship, but I know that at Rav Schneer and Rav Soloveitchik were close. Now, what would you attribute to where it's not just where Lakewood has grown and, and the community has grown because people want to live near the yeshiva? Look at the <laughs> explosion today. And even areas like Tom's River, where so many people are moving to, but moving out of Brooklyn and Rockland County and elsewhere. But it also was a success, not just in spreading Torah, but also financial success, where you can have uh, the grandson of Rav Aaron Cutler, of Aaron Cutler, who I believe was, according to what the media reports were, 
that he was just bought out as being the CEO for some like $15 million. We're talking about a major amount that shows the financial viability of a, of Yeshiva like Lakewood. Uh, no, abs absolutely. Well, two things, uh, just to make a couple of points on that. One, Lakewood, the city, it's no longer just based Medrash Kavaya. It's not just the Yeshiva, you know, for, you know, for some say for better, some say for worse, but it's become, you know, an affordable uh, Jewish metropolis, more affordable than, you know, New York, although as a real estate attorney in Rockland County, I would encourage you always to buy in Rockland County or sell, but give our firm a call. Well, where, where do you get the better deal in Rockland County or Lakewood? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to answer that. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so I would say that um, <clears throat> it's definitely, it's definitely part of the trend to Lakewood is affordability. Now also, once somebody has a lot of their children in Lakewood, um, they might themselves retire to Lakewood and there's these retirement communities that have sprung up in Lakewood now where people, you know, something of a brain drain, you know, retirees have a lot of to add and, you know, in other communities and Lakewood is getting them. But, but going back to the question of the financial viability, there's definitely been, you know, at, you know, going back to the growth of orthodoxy in America through the yeshivas, we now have, you know, yeshiva educated Balabatim, whether it's a professional path that they've taken or whether it's in the business sense, We've, we've been blessed, you know, that, you know, as a community, but that people have been incredibly successful and that's allowed for, you know, uh, people to give significant sums of money to Yeshiva University and to Lakewood and to Mary Stroll and to other yeshivas and uh, succeed in, 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 in allowing people to sit and learn and create Tamiri Chachamim. No, it has, even though YU has had its share of financial difficulties, even now, I mean, they're getting out of it between the Bernie Madoff affair and other factors of <coughs> a lot of property it certainly was rough going for a while yeshiva university uh i yes i believe there were definitely were some challenges i think uh in the past 20 30 in the past 20 years as well um my understanding is that in the 70s it was even worse in yeshiva university um i think they also another factor in why you specifically is that uh rabbi dr bernard lander and the whole toro college system to some degree has siphoned off students and resources and support somewhat, obviously, you know, in, in all these conversations, can so from Tarba Chachma, you know, competition between YU and Lakewood or Landers or other yeshivas definitely can increase, you know, you have to make your yeshiva and institution a better product. But correct, I think YU is my, again, I'm not uh, their chief financial officer, but I think they've had some financial challenges in recent years, but I think they're, my understanding is they're getting Right, things are have been improving, but it's it's been a process. And then now also, for, and listen, the yeshiva world is facing problems with the yeshivas uh, themselves, where the Department of Education is, is scrutinizing them, wants them to up their secular education, which Yeshiva University doesn't have that kind of situation they, with their schools. Um, but they also have their problems, for example, being a university, getting federal funds. They had a problem with having a gay and lesbian club, which they closed down, but uh, there's a whole thing going on regarding that, uh, the constitutionality of that, which will probably be adjudicated by the Supreme Court. So they have their own challenges being more modern in today's day and age as well. Uh, no, it's definitely, look, being more, you know, to use one of the terms, <clears throat> being more open in certain ways, trying to engage in harmonious coexistence, to use Revel's terminology, with Western society and the Torah, is in some ways more challenging, you know, as you pointed out, right? You have, you know, you know, the Torah is pretty clear on certain topics, yet they want to have this type of club, which, you know, is hard for, for at least someone from my perspective to even fathom. Well, that's um, what the Rosh Hashiva is and why we're opposed to that, because you can't be a religious school and have, a, you know, a gay club. But on the other hand, since they take government funds, it's much harder for them, you know, to walk away from having the club. They shut down all the clubs, you know, because of that. And I think they're, um, there, there's stuff that's working on behind the scenes, but it makes it much tougher. You're not going to have that kind of a problem with Lakewood. Correct, correct. Lakewood, you know, again, when you have the, you know, at least for now, you know, truth be told, that's only for now. I think one of the things that is another place where we could be united on is that the, the here there's an attempt to, uh, charters aside, right, that, you know, who can decide what goes on in our yeshivas and in our schools. And, you know, that whether that, you know, obviously we should have some, at least some degree of, institutional independence, whether that's Yeshiva University, whether that's Lakewood, whether that's the Hasidic schools, that's a core question that we have to face in 2022. And I think that's something that orthodoxy could have a united response on. 
We're speaking with Shmuel Winniars. He's a real estate attorney with Herbst and Weiss. He's a Talmud of Ner Yisrael Baltimore, Merkaz Atari Yerushalayim. We're looking at Lakewood versus Shu University, shaping of orthodoxy in America and how orthodoxy has grown. And uh, thanks also through the Lakewood on one end and Yeshiva University on our other end, where they've really grown by leaps and bounds. You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner. America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. And we're back. Our final stretch looking at Lakewood versus Shiva University, shaping the shaping of orthodoxy in America. Shmuel Winniar's Esquire is with us. He's a historian. And we're looking at how orthodoxy has grown and been reshaped uh, in America and where it's grown, where today it's... Uh, Fast growing movement. You have a lot of Bali Chuvas and people returning to Judaism um, that also, I think, have made a change. And you find in general, there's a move to the right, which I think benefits more Lakewood than Yeshiva University. Uh, there's definitely, de Bali Chuva definitely come with a certain energy and a certain zeal that sometimes people, you know, who uh, born and bred Orthodox are more used to it. Um, I think Yeshiva University has also benefited. I think uh, Lakewood has benefited people where backgrounds they're coming from. Sometimes, you know, I think there's benefits, truthfully, that Yeshiva University provides to the Haredi world or even Lakewood and vice versa as well. But I think you're right to say that often Bali Chuva, the yeshivas, they'll come to, there's yeshiva named after my brother in Mansi, Kol Taras David for Bali Chuva, and there's yeshivas in Eretz Yisrael, um, which tend to come and they tend to gravitate towards the Haredi world, and often they bring to the Haredi world, as you pointed out, you know, necessarily some of the degrees and education and qualifications that might be more found in YU, but are not necessarily as often found in Lakewood or similar communities. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, you, Lakewood is it's a Litzvah, it's a Lithuanian type yeshiva, it's the that style. Yeshiva University also is based on, you know, on, on that, on intellectual, on the studies, and they've had major impact. But you don't, I don't know if there's any Hasidic institution, the equivalent of Lakewood, um, but a lot of Hasidim have been going to Lakewood. Even Sarpma, I think you find a lot more Sarpma Hasidim going to Lakewood. So on the one hand, we have the Hasidification of orthodoxy, but when it comes to learning, you still have the dominance of the Lithuanian style of learning. Uh, that, that is correct. I think, uh, you know, specific to Lakewood, let's say the Munkat Rebbe, I think it was well known that he learned in Tells in Cleveland in its heyday. Um, and today, yes, if you walk into the Lakewood based Madrash or the Mir in Yerushalayim, which I also learned in for a little bit, significant amounts of Chasidish Shabbatrim. And, you know, it's a good place for, you know, conversations and social interactions to be had. And uh, I think also, not uh, specific to Lakewood, but I think there's also a neo Hasidist movement, which is probably more in Yeshiva University, people studying various Hasidish farms that probably, you know, in Yeshivas that I went to, we didn't really do that. But in YU, it's probably happening a little bit more. And I think, again, without losing your, you know, your sub uh, communal uh, identity, you know, I think you could have, I like to call it dual passports. You could have your passport for one, you know, within your own. Today, you're allowed to have it. Once upon a time, the FBI would investigate you for that. Um, but today, you could have a passport to where you're from, but also to the broader Jewish ways to, you know, Jewish shivim panim latayra. No, true, but just interesting because overall we're becoming the Hasidification. I spoke to Rabbi Moshe Elfin of the Orthodox Union, even peanut oil on Pesach, which used to be uh, around now because of the Hasidic influence, you don't have, you have lots of other ways of manifestation of the Hasidification of Orthodoxy. But yes, when it comes to the learning, I find it fascinating that the old yeshiva system of the Lithuanian yeshivas are still dominant. Well, I see. I see. Yeah, no, I hear your point. I think um, there's just, you know, pontificating on the spot a little bit is that, as you said, we're now we've been in America, you know, Yeshiva Serbian Silicon in, in its first formation has been around for since 1886. Lakewood's been around since 1943. For better and for worse, we're far more confident in our orthodoxy and in our communities. You know, we, you know, perhaps perhaps in a way that we have to be nervous that we're going to be too comfortable with. But if you want the highest level of glass kosher, so you're going to do that. If you want the highest level of learning, come to the Lithuanian yeshivas, whether that's Lakewood, whether that's Yeshiva University, that's still the brand that's the highest level, the most rigorous, the most text-based. And I think that's why it still attracts people. No, it has. And you have lots of, you know, fine, and you have from Yeshiva University. And I think, 
what I'm seeing, you find more of an integration with even when the Haredi world is more acceptable today than 30 or 40 years ago. And that's nice to see there where well, you have the blending of Hasidim and Lithuanians. You also have the blending of Yeshua University and Lakewood or those kind of uh, shuls will have even a Wayu type rabbi. It, it's, it's nice to see that that change on the American Orthodox scene. No, no, 100%. You know, you live on the west side. I used to live in Riverdale for nine years. And I think we see in the, specifically in those communities where people are living near each other and in proximity, you know, whether it's Rabbi Daniel Stein on the west side and more yeshiva people learning from him. And I was privileged to live in Davin. I lived next to Rabbi Mordechai Willig in Davin in the Shul for nine years. And also the, there's a Tells Riverdale Kohl, right, you know, right up the block and they're learning from Rabbi Willig and vice versa. And in, especially in, in the tri-state area, generally in the larger communities, you could be in a Haredi yeshiva community or a more modern community. And sometimes there's less chances for interaction. But when you go more, I grew up in Toronto, you go to other more, somewhat more out of town communities, you're living more in proximity and there's ways, there's ways for synergies to really be had and benefit Bali Israel. And Rabbi Daniel Stein, he was a good case in point though. A big Talmud Chacham from Yeshiva University, and uh, he was selected to to lead a shtibel, the Ritnika shtibel on the Upper West Side right. of Manhattan. So I think most of the the, the people who dive in there probably went to more right wing yeshivas. Correct, and you have you, know, you have a lot of Hasidim, and you have also yeshivish. But even though that growth of that shul, and I and I go there on occasion, you see a lot of the young people who are more modern blending. It's a beautiful thing to see the the, the how yeshivish people, the Hasidish people, get along with the more modern people in the shul itself, and that's that's one of there should be more places like that. Bezer uh, Hashem, hopefully that that, that long before, before that's I let that's you go, I just want to put you on again your historical hat. Tell us the story about the mafia of Aaron Cutler, where they came to see him. It's a famous story, and it's a fascinating one. So perhaps you can shed some of it might be legend, but tell us what exactly happened. So when, uh, so there, I believe there's two parts. I believe, and again, I, I did not double check this before we spoke, so I may have gotten some facts wrong here. But uh, Rip Schneer Cutler, right, the son of Aaron Cutler and his successor, um, the <laughs> was came that the uh, group of, uh, some sort of Italian mafia group came to Rav Schneer Cutler and, and uh, everyone was a little bit surprised. Why is he coming to base Medish Gavoa? It didn't seem that he was the bright person for the job. So it seems that he got a bracha, that this person's father got a bracha from Baron Cutler. Blessing. For Baron Cutler, before he started BMG for about a year and a half, he, uh, right when he came to America, he was primarily focused on Vad Hatzala. His primary focus was saving Jews from Europe before he was started talking about building the yeshiva here. And when that became ended, he started... Well, didn't, didn't they even go on Shabbos to the White House because it was a question of Pikuach Nefesh of saving lives and made it a point of whatever had to be done to save Jews. I think Rav Aaron Cutler and a lot of Rabbanim worked even with the left because it was really a dangerous situation where they just looked to help Jews. It was Pikuach Nefesh, you know, and no doubt about it. And whether it was the March to Washington, which I don't think Rav Aaron Cutler was part of, but anything that was could be done to save Jews or Baron Cutler was involved. He had his relationship with Henry Morgenthau, the Secretary of the Treasury, if I recall correctly. And and so for that time frame, he gave a bracha to a um, <coughs> to a some sort of mafia head who had a connection who could have helped save people. And the bracha was that he should live and die in his own bed at an old age. Uh, for a mafia head, obviously that's a big bracha, vikachava, and that's what happened. And the children came, and the children came. They wanted to get the bracha for themselves. And Roshner supposedly said that, you know, I don't have the kayak, I don't have the influence, I don't have the powers that my father did. But that just shows his Rav Aaron's influence. But what was the reason why Rav Aaron gave the blessing to the head of the mafia? Because I believe he was instrumental in helping bring certain Talmidei Chachamim or certain Jews, I don't know if it was specific, to be able to help get them out of Europe. Shmuel Werniers, I want to thank you for being here with us, a historian. He is a lawyer with Herbst and Weiss in Rockland County, New York. We appreciate your giving us some insights into the shaping of orthodoxy between Yeshiva University and Lakewood Yeshiva. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much.